Hello everyone, thank you very much for coming uh, to the on the Friday uh, before Thanksgiving. And uh, it's my great great pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Rock or Roko. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and he's also my academic brother. So the Kabe Parliament gave a talk yesterday. He was also my academic brother. So today, this week, it has been a uh, Dave Stevenson family re reunion week. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, Joe received his um, uh, bachelor's degree in uh, Yale in 2012 um, in astronomy and physics and geo geology and geophysics. And he spent a couple of months in uh, DC uh, as a um, science policy fellow in the National Research Council. And then he moved to uh, Caltech and joined the uh, Stevenson family. And he received his uh, master's degree in 2014 and received his uh, PhD in uh, 2017. And now he's um, a postdoc fellow at the School of Earth and Space Exploration called the uh, CC in uh, Arizona State University. Um, and, uh, and also I want to mention that he has been um, recipient of uh, numerous awards, including Graduate Research Award, AGU Study of the Earth, Earth Deep Interior in 2016, and also Outstanding Student Presentation Award in 2016. So he's been uh, doing a great work, and I'm very uh, looking forward to hearing about uh, his presentation today. OK. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, Mickey, and thank you uh, all for coming. Again, Joe O'Rourke, postdoc from Arizona State University. And I'm here to give maybe a new perspective in some ways on an old question, which is why does Venus lack an internally generated global magnetic field today? And is it possible that Venus had a global magnetic field in the past? So uh, Venus is a planet that has fascinated me ever since I started being a planetary scientist. It's arguably the most Earth-like planet uh, in our solar system. It's just a little bit smaller than Earth, but the bulk densities are the same, so we assume that Venus and Earth are made of the same stuff. Yet Venus is one of the least understood planets in our solar system. Um, we know that now the surface is a hellish wasteland. There's a thick carbon dioxide rich atmosphere that is 90 times as massive as Earth's atmosphere. And so the surface temperatures are hot enough to melt lead. But many first order questions about the past on Venus still await answers. We don't know if Venus ever supported oceans or even life. And we don't know why uh, Venus is currently so different in terms of conditions than Earth is today. And whether or not um, these celestial siblings started out on the same path or whether they diverged uh, from the earliest times in the solar system. And I think it's really important to study Venus, um, even if you're not just obsessed with this particular planet. Because if we don't understand why Venus and Earth are different, we can't hope to make general theories uh, to understand the evolution of other rocky planets, particularly the thousands of exoplanets that we're discovering that have similar masses and sizes as Earth um, orbiting other stars. So there are many interesting aspects of Venus. Uh, the one I'm going to focus on in this talk is the fact that Venus is unique in being the only major planet in our solar system for which we don't have evidence of an internally generated magnetic field either now or in the past. Uh, the best constraints on the magnetism of Venus come from a magnetometer on an 80s mission called Pioneer Venus Orbiter. And uh, this mission failed to detect any global magnetic field and put an upper limit on the dipole moment that is 100 thousandth times Earth's. And there has been no detection of magnetized rocks on the crust of Venus. Um, uh, such a detection is theoretically possible because the surface temperature of Venus is currently more than 100 degrees below the Curie point of magnetite, a very common magnetic mineral. Um, and Pioneer Venus Orbiter, because of Venus's thick atmosphere, wasn't able to get close enough to the surface to do a definitive test. And also, there are confounding signals from the atmospheric interaction of, of Venus with the solar wind. And so if you want to pick up any crustal signal from orbit, you have to be able to model out um, those atmospheric interactions, which is very difficult. So um, there we go. Uh, so not every terrestrial planet has a global magnetic field today. Earth, of course, does. We know that Earth had a magnetic field uh, without very long interruption for as long in Earth's history as we have unmetamorphosed rocks, uh, which go back about three and a half billion years ago. And there are tentative claims that uh, detrital zircons in the Jack Hills of Western Australia record a magnetic field in even older epochs, going back uh, nearly to when Earth formed. Uh, but those claims are, uh, are controversial at the moment. Uh, Mars has no magnetic field today. 
uh, but we know from orbiters uh, that there is crustal remnant magnetism in, uh, indicating that there was a dynamo on Mars, but that died by 4.1 billion years ago. Mercury, uh, smaller than Earth, small like Mars, so you might expect it not to have a magnetic field, but it does. It has a field that's albeit weaker than Earth's, but certainly exists, and the messenger mission uh, to Mercury discovered crustal remnant magnetism uh, that's possibly as old as 3.8 billion years. And the moon, uh, moon, tiny, tiny core, um, but somehow was able to sustain a magnetic field maybe for as long as 3 billion years, even though it doesn't have one today. So um, it's very, it's actually very strange uh, that Venus, being the same size as Earth, presumably made out of the same stuff, doesn't have a magnetic field. Um, and to begin to investigate why, we can look at two really basic criteria for, why, uh, for what you need to have a magnetic field. Uh, the first is simply that the Coriolis force has to be, quote unquote, dynamically significant, as expressed by the, having the Rossby number at the equator be much smaller than one. So here, V is a typical convective velocity in the liquid core, this omega is the angular rotation rate, and L is the length scale of the dynamo region, so the size of the core. And uh, Venus has the slowest rotation of any planet in our solar system. And I think in some textbook somewhere it says that that's the reason why Venus doesn't have a dynamo, because people always uh, say this to me. But um, even for Venus, the Rossby number is 10 to the minus 5, which is much, much smaller than 1. And so this probably isn't the reason uh, that Venus lacks a magnetic field. So if it succeeds in this first criterion, it must fail the second criterion. And the second criterion is that the magnetic Reynolds number has to be greater than some critical value, which is around 10. So uh, V is the same, the velocity, V and L, L is the core size, and then this lambda is the magnetic diffusivity, um, which is inversely proportional to the electrical conductivity. So in Earth, uh, the reason that we have a magnetic field is that we have convection of uh, iron-rich alloy in the liquid portion of the core, and iron is sufficiently conductive electrically um, that this Reynolds number is pretty high. Uh, so this statement has to be true somehow, that Venus doesn't have a liquid core that vigorously convects. So either Venus has no core, or it has a core, but the core is not liquid, or it has a liquid core, but the liquid core is not convecting. Um, and in fact, we can use that Reynolds number criteria to explain the fact that dynamos are ubiquitous at gas giant planets, um, but are sort of marginal on terrestrial planets. And so this is a, um, a plot with no units, but two axes. And this horizontal uh, axis is the thermal conductivity, which is probably proportional-ish to the electrical conductivity. And then this uh, vertical axis is the size of the core. And there's three regions to this plot, and only in the middle region can you have a uh, core-driven, a convection-driven dynamo. Uh, on this side, um, you have very high conductivity, which you might think is good for the dynamo, because if things are electrically conductive, they can move more flux around. Um, but if the thermal conductivity is really high, for a given core heat flow, uh, the core will lose its heat by conduction, and there won't be significant fluid motion. The fluid will be stagnant, no dynamo. Um, and in this region, you might be cooling the core uh, fast enough that you have convection, but it's not conductive enough, or the core is too small, and you don't have a dynamo. So gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn are squarely in the center of this region. No surprise, they all have dynamos. Uh, ice giant planets, well, maybe um, Water at high pressure is a little less conductive than metallic hydrogen, but the cores are still pretty big and it's still sort of conductive, um, so not a surprise that they have dynamos. And Venus and Earth, being the same size uh, and made of the same stuff, plot at the same point on this diagram. So clearly there must be some other axes that are important. Uh, so there is a canonical story for Venus uh, published by Francis Nimmo in 2002, and um, it uh, claims that the reason doesn't, that Venus doesn't have a dynamo is that the core is Earth-like, um, but it's just cooling too slowly to convect. So the idea in this oversimplified cartoon is that Venus and Earth basically started off on the same path. Uh, maybe they both had plate tectonics, and uh, because of plate tectonics, the mantle was cooling down, and as the mantle temperature dropped, the core mantle heat flux decreased, but was still high enough that you could have a dynamo in ancient times. But then somehow Venus lost all of its water. Uh, the runaway greenhouse effect made the surface temperatures very hot, and plate tectonics shut down uh, about a billion years ago. And then after this time, if the uh, uh, core mantle temperature contrast is small, when the mantle starts heating up after plate tectonics ends, core cooling will shut off. And the core heat flow actually drops to literally zero, uh, which would completely kill a dynamo, even if the core of Venus has exactly the same structure and composition as Earth. So uh, in recent times, there have been some complications uh, that people have developed 
through a variety of investigations. And uh, all of these different things, they don't necessarily push the story in one direction or another, but they really motivate reconsidering the whole problem. And um, the first thing is that the thermal conductivity of the core, which is this crucial parameter I've been talking about, is, uh, has been debated in recent years. Um, I think people are still struggling to come to a consensus, so I just say that it's uncertain within a factor of two or three, which turns out to make a difference. Um, the second thing is that people have long believed that uh, if you don't have an inner core like Earth does now, then in early times you can only drive a dynamo using secular cooling or radiogenic heating. But there's been a lot of recent work on sources of compositional convection uh, that operate at temperatures higher than temperatures where the inner core starts to form. And then uh, this whole catastrophic resurfacing hypothesis has been revisited in recent years. And the key observation is that the fraction of craters on Venus, um, which have been embayed after they were formed by volcanism, may be a factor of eight higher than was, um, is uh, commonly believed. So all these things sort of mean that we need a new story for Venus um, and we need to figure out if the fact that Venus doesn't have a magnetic field is really compatible with an Earth-like origin and formation of the core. So um, what I'm eventually going to get to in this talk is uh, presenting a set of geodynamic simulations. And these are an extension of a work that was done by my collaborators Cedric Gilman and Paul Tackley uh, and published in 2014. And they involve uh, coupled models of the evolution of the atmosphere and the mantle. So the atmosphere sets the surface temperature, which is the boundary condition for mantle convection. And then mantle convection um, sets the core mantle heat flow, which is the boundary condition for the evolution of the core. And so what I'm going to do in these simulations is run a bunch of simulations for the evolution of Venus that match the uh, history of volcanism and tectonism that we think occurred, and see um, if they predict that Venus lacks a dynamo today. And if they do predict that Venus lacks a dynamo today, then that means that the core can't be Earth-like. Um, but if they don't predict that Venus has a dynamo today, um, then we can ask some second-order questions like what the magnetic field was like in the past and how we could best detect crustal remnant magnetism to try to actually put some observational constraints on this problem. Uh, but before I get into the simulations, I'll go through these three challenges that I identified. So the th th first one is that the thermal conductivity of iron and in particular, the iron alloy that comprises the core of Earth and presumably Venus uh, is uncertain. So under ambient conditions, um, the thermal conductivity of iron is about 50 watts per meter per Kelvin. And um, in the last like five years or so, uh, well, so um, before about five years ago, people thought that these ambient values were basically the values appropriate for Earth's core, even though Earth's core is obviously much hotter and at much higher pressure. Uh, but then recently, there's been a bevy of theoretical and experimental work that suggests that under high temperature and pressure conditions, the electrical conductivity of iron and iron alloys increases dramatically. And when you use the so-called Wiedemann-Franz law that says that the electrical and thermal conductivity are proportional, um, then you get uh, thermal conductivities for the core that are two or three times higher than have previously been um, thought to be relevant. Uh, but the pendulum has sort of swung away maybe a little bit in recent years from those values because people have tried to do uh, direct measurements of thermal conductivity in diamond anvil cells and found that the lower values, um, these like closer to 50, are actually maybe appropriate. So uh, my take on this is that this is still very much an open question and reality could come down at one side or the other uh, because this Wiedemann-Franz law, which is actually just an empirical relation, uh, could not be valid at high temperatures and pressures. Alternatively, these experiments are really hard, really cutting edge, and involve a lot of possible sources of air. So there could be some uh, unknown systematics that's going on here. Um, but the fact that uh, the thermal conductivity is possibly very high actually caused some consternation in the geophysical community because uh, with these high conductivities, it's very, very difficult to, su to sustain a dynamo prior uh, to the nucleation of the inner core. And the inner core uh, on Earth, it's about 1,200 kilometers in radius, but that size corresponds to less than 150 degrees of cooling. So in the past, when the core was only uh, about 200 degrees hotter, there wouldn't have been any inner core. And you need some other source, maybe, of compositional buoyancy to drive the dynamo. So, uh, this problem motivated uh, me and Dave Stevenson to make a proposal in uh, early 2016, is when it was published, 
that you can have magnesium uh, precipitation from the core actually provide a source of compositional buoyancy. And this relies on what seemed like a reasonable inference that um, the, the solubility of magnesium and iron alloy is strongly dependent on temperature. So the idea is that the reason, so under, under ambient conditions, magnesium and iron are basically immiscible. Um, but under high temperatures, the entropy term in Gibbs free energy becomes super large. Uh, and that in general favors things mixing with uh, metal alloy. So the idea is that we think there was a big moon forming impact. Um, and that would have heated at least part of the Earth to really, really hot temperatures. And if you have the core of the impactor, as it passes uh, through the proto-Earth to form Earth's core, a uh, part of it will emulsify into the literally like centimeter scale droplets that are needed uh, to have thermodynamic chemical equilibration between mantle and silicate. So through this process, if you equilibrate just like five or 10% of Earth at really high temperatures in the aftermath of impacts, you can stuff like one weight percent of magnesium into the core. So just 1% of the core, but um, when you cool the core, even at very, very slow rates, the very strong temperature dependence of solubility um, means that you get a lot of mass flux out of the core. So magnesium comes out of the core and it drags along things like oxygen and silicon, and that's light. And so if they go to the core mantle boundary, the fluid that's left behind is dense, so the fluid will go down and this drives convection. So even if this fluid is very hot, it will become compositionally dense and uh, the core will convect. And so uh, when we published this data, there weren't a lot of experiments on the behavior of magnesium in iron at the requisite extremely high uh, temperature conditions. And this sort of bothered me, but then I remembered my uh, quote from my favorite philosopher of science, which is that science is essentially anarchy. Uh, there's no formal scientific method. And the only principle is that anything goes. So OK. So um, we just cited the proceedings of my imagination and published this uh, paper, which is good. Um, so yes, so full-blown anarchy, yay. But it was somewhat of a relief then uh, when a few months later uh, this actual experimental study appeared. And uh, James Badger and colleagues did experiments under um, realistic temperature conditions. And so these are metal silicate partitioning experiments. So you start the experiment with a silicate surrounding some metal. And then you squeeze it in a diamond anvil cell and heat it up with lasers. And uh, you wait uh, a little bit of time, which is sufficient for uh, these things to come into chemical equilibration. And then you measure the compositions uh, afterwards, and from that derive all the thermodynamic parameters. And they found, indeed, uh, this is the equilibrium concentration of magnesium oxide in the metal um, after equilibration at such a temperature that under low temperatures, um, like are in traditional core formation models, you get virtually no magnesium in the metal. But under the high temperature conditions for giant impacts, you get several weight percent of magnesium oxide going to the metal. And this is weirdly correspond, corresponded very, very well um, to what we had previously used for our uh, energetic calculations. So big relief. OK, so since I'm here, I got to acknowledge the fact that there's been a lot more recent work done on this uh, subject by Ji Shui and many uh, of you who also might be in the audience. And stop me if I get any of this wrong. Um, but you're doing uh, very similar experiments, but in a sort of different compositional space. So running the experiments so that in the end, you have very large amounts of sulfur and carbon in the equilibrated metal. Um, whereas James Badger's experiments were done basically without sulfur and carbon. And um, people think that the core certainly doesn't have uh, 10 or 20 weight percent of these two combined. Um, and, but the fact that you have a lot of sulfur and carbon in the metal means that oxygen doesn't like to enter the metal also. So you have very low oxygen. And then if you, f you measure the amount of magnesium in the metal, and if you fit that uh, data to an equation that only has the concentration of oxygen in it, then you find that the abundance of magnesium in the metal depends only on the oxygen content of the metal. Um, and so basically what this means is that when I was running uh, my theory simulations, when James was analyzing his experiments, uh, he was assuming perfectly ideal thermodynamics where the abundances of other light elements in the metal um, doesn't change the activity coefficient for magnesium. But what Jishui and others are arguing is that the compositional effects probably are pretty significant. Um, that means that the amount of magnesium in the metal depends on how much oxygen or how much uh, other stuff that you have in the metal. Um, and so from this, uh, the conclusion is that if it only depends, really only depends on the oxygen content, and the oxygen content of the core doesn't change much over Earth's history, um, then you won't get a lot of magnesium precipitation out of the core as the core is cooling. Um, but I would say um, that might be right. Uh, I fully acknowledge that. 
Um, but I think that you really need to do uh, more experiments, always more experiments, right? This is what theorists always want. Uh, more experiments so that we can fit for every parameter that we know is uh, probably relevant. And you want to be really careful that when you're analyzing your experimental data, um, if you subtract terms that involve the sulfur content or the carbon content, and you find that do that doesn't improve the residuals of your data, that could be because um, these terms literally are unimportant, that sulfur and carbon don't matter. But it could also just be that uh, your data is so noisy or you don't have enough of them that you can't simultaneously constrain all these things. And sort of by definition, if you add other terms, um, that's going to lower, uh, you don't need as extreme values um, for other terms in order to explain the data. So uh, I would sort of, I would bet maybe one of my fingers, maybe part of the finger, that we're in this uh, later regime uh, where right now we just don't have enough data to fully uh, characterize everything. Um, but I know that more experiments are underway by James Badrow and colleagues and other groups. Um, so I think hopefully, I mean, people certainly think that this is really interesting. Um, and so I think this is like a problem that will be solved, which is great. Um, had some other thing to say. Oh yeah, um, and it's also good to do experiments uh, that should sort of overlap um, from different groups so you can see if there's any sort of systematic effects um, between groups as well. Okay, we got through it, great. Um, so, uh, so <laughs> there's that debate over magnesium oxide. And then there's this other like orthogonal discussion that's going on, um, which is this new report uh, by K. Hiroshi and colleagues which is that the uh, solubility of stichovite, SiO2, in metal um, might be very strongly pressure dependent. And this would mean that you can form the core uh, by equilibration in the mantle at like mid-mantle depths and uh, even without extreme temperatures. And then so you get a certain amount of silicon and oxygen in the metal. And then that metal drops to the core. And because it's increasing in pressure, then suddenly uh, silicon and oxygen uh, want to precipitate back out of the core. And weirdly, in these models, um, I, I'm not even sure if these models are mutually consistent. Um, and uh, they do a sort of different type of experiment, which has like different systematics. Um, but they predicted basically the same mass flux uh, starting at about the same temperatures for the core. Um, and so the crucial parameters for uh, geodynamic simulations are the uh, mass rate of precipitation, which is about half a weight percent uh, per 100 Kelvin of cooling in the core. And uh, either of these processes would start uh, at 4,500 Kelvin. So um, I mean, I'm just like a theorist, right? Like I don't do experiments. Um, when Jishre and I worked in the same lab, actually when I was an undergrad, none of my experiments worked. Uh, <laughs> so you should take my, uh, anything I say about experiments with a very large grain of salt. But um, I, I just there's a lot of uncertainty um, in this. But it's a very exciting, like cutting edge stuff. and um, and yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of progress made and a lot of new interesting things discovered. OK, but the, the point is that it's very nice to have another source of compositional buoyancy um, besides the inner core. Um, and so what I have here is plotted some very simple thermal evolution simulations for Earth. And I'm running it backwards in time. So this is the present and then just running backwards. And then this is the entropy in the core that's available for dissipation to produce a dynamo. So it needs to be over 0. Um, and if you have very high thermal conductivity, um, then at current times, uh, if you have an inner core, your entropy production is unambiguously positive. Um, but before the inner core formed, which here is about 700 million years ago, your entropy production is negative if you don't have precipitation. But if you do invoke this uh, process, then you can um, have positive entropy production for the entire age of Earth um, without having to invoke very large amounts of radiogenic heating, which is maybe higher than people think are plausible. And you also, um, so from observations, we think that the core mantle heat flow uh, from Earth, from like the buoyancy of mantle plumes and from um, post-perovskite phase transitions, we think it's somewhere in the range of like 5 to 15 terawatts. And if you don't have precipitation, you really need it to be 15 terawatts. Uh, it's very hard to get your models to work if it's like 10 or 5. But if you have precipitation, then it's OK if it turns out that reality is like 5 terawatts that are coming out of the core. Um, and, or if the thermal conductivity is very low, then you also have a lessened need for precipitation. Um, but of course, like the actual mineral partitioning doesn't really care about the conductivity of the metal. OK, so uh, hopefully all that will spark a lot of further discussion. Um, so back to Venus, uh, I wanted to talk about this third challenge, which was uh, the history of volcanism on the surface. 
And the key observation is the distribution of impact craters. Um, I like studying craters on Venus because it's great if you're really lazy, uh, because there's only 1,000 craters on Venus. Um, whereas on Mars and the Moon, there's lots of really, really small craters. So if you really want to count all of them, you, it'll take your whole scientific career. Um, but Venus, the thick atmosphere, screens out all craters that are smaller than like five kilometers or so. Uh, and the key observation uh, when Magellan made radar maps of Venus in the early 90s is that the spatial coordinates of the craters, their latitudes and their longitudes, are indistinguishable from a, ra a random distribution. Um, and furthermore, only 10% of the craters, which are these little red guys, um, are obviously embayed by volcanic flows that bury a significant portion of the ejecta blanket or of the crater rims. Uh, and these uh, red craters, uh, sorry, the, the embayed craters, which I have depicted as red, uh, are spatially clustered on the surface. And um, the way to get that in a very simple mechanism is to, at some age, just wipe the surface of Venus clean and then uh, have only very, very small amounts of volcanism subsequent to that global catastrophic resurfacing event. Um, and this, would, this has been this like catastrophic resurfacing hypothesis, so it's very popular. And unfortunately, we're really limited uh, because the data quality for Venus, uh, because Venus has been underserved by spacecraft missions, are quite poor. Um, the radar images have a spatial resolution of about 100 meters, and the altimetry data is even worse. The horizontal, um, the best horizontal resolution of topography on Venus is 10 kilometers, uh, which is insufficient to really characterize individual impact craters or to map individual lava flows. Okay, um, but so I mentioned on the last slide that only 10% of the craters on Venus are obviously embayed. Uh, but there's been a recent proposal that 80% of the craters on Venus might be embayed in a way that is not immediately obvious. Um, so the, the observation is that 80% of the craters on Venus look like this. So um, they have floors that are dark uh, in radar, which means smooth, uh, but their central peaks are bright and their rims and their ejecta are bright, but they don't have totally complete ejecta blankets. And there's hints in stereotopography, which has been made for about 20% of the surface, that these craters with dark floors are systematically shallower uh, than craters with bright floors. And we don't think that there's a lot of aeolian transport of sediment on Venus, um, because there's no water for weathering and not a lot of winds. Um, so the idea is that these dark floor craters have been filled somehow with volcanism. And uh, in 2014, I did some simple Monte Carlo simulations of cratering and resurfacing on Venus. And I found that the spatial distribution of um, dark and bright floored craters on Venus is consistent with models where you don't have catastrophic resurfacing, but you just have thin, low viscosity flows that um, partially fill craters. And also the size distribution of the dark floored craters and the bright floored craters uh, matches these models as well. So um, a future orbiter mapping mission to Venus is necessary to prove or disprove whether or not these dark floored craters are partially embayed. But if they are, then catastrophic resurfacing can't be correct. Um, if they're not embayed, though, then you do need catastrophic resurfacing because it's impossible. In these Monte Carlo simulations, I also found that you can't reproduce the clustering of the quote unquote obviously embayed craters on Venus um, without a catastrophic model. OK, and um, in either catastrophic or non catastrophic models, you need at least some recent volcanism on Venus to explain uh, the low emissivity at hotspot analogs. And with Sue Smukar, I also recently um, did an analysis of the heat flow at these enigmatic features called coronae. Uh, we studied their flexure, uh, from which you can derive a heat flow if you make certain assumptions about the rheology of the lithosphere, and found that at these features um, called coronae, the heat flow, at least when they formed, is uh, close to the global average heat flow for Earth. Um, but coronae are probably sites of unusually high heat flow um, from Earth. So the sort of general prediction from geodynamic models that the surface heat flow from Venus is about half the surface heat flow from Earth are probably filled out. OK, so now that I've spent 30 minutes on background information in my introduction, um, I'll actually get to what I promised you at the very start, uh, which is these new geodynamic simulations of the coupled uh, atmosphere, surface, mantle, core evolution of Venus. And again, just to remind you, um, the goal is to run simulations that match the, that produce non-catastrophic resurfacing. Again, if we're betting fingers, that's what I'd bet on. Um, and also the surface heat flow. And uh, the new aspect of these simulations is that I've uh, made a model for the core that can include precipitation, uh, where you can vary the thermal conductivity and really study all the relevant parameters. 
Uh, and again, the criteria, I'm assuming in all my simulations, I'm assuming that the core has Earth-like structure and composition just because that's the easiest thing to model. Um, but it's still useful because if uh, those simulations predict the dynamo today, then we can infer that the core is not Earth-like. So uh, just some details about the models. Uh, we're using a 1D analytic uh, gray atmosphere that has a radiative layer over a convective layer. Um, and we're assuming a particular evolution for Venus uh, in which most of the CO2 degassed during the rapid crystallization of the magma ocean so that Venus never had condensed water oceans. And because uh, the magma is almost completely degassed, the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere starts out around 88 bars and changes by less than 1% over all of geologic time. And so the greenhouse gas um, that really affects the surface temperature is water, even though water is a, a minor constituent of the total atmosphere. And so uh, water is added by volcanism um, whenever the mantle melts and removed by hydrodynamic escape in early times and by various other processes in later times. Um, and so this is sort of a, a cool model because it lets us vary the surface temperature over time, but it does have some caveats. Uh, the big one is that we're assuming that Venus had a constant albedo uh, over its whole history, uh, which is determined by the cloud physics. Uh, although we do take into account the fact that the sun likely had a uh, lower, lower total flux and a lower lum luminosity than it does today. And this uh, cloud thing is a major complication that if uh, different assumptions were made could affect the surface temperatures by hundreds of degrees. Uh, the problem is that it's very difficult to accurate, accurately um, or approaching accurately model clouds without running a full 3D uh, GCM, which would really complicate things. Um, and also, again, we are assuming that there were no condensed water oceans on Venus ever, um, which is there's a, there's a possibility that about 20% of the surface, which is this highly pectinized terrain called tessera, actually has very felsic composition. So if these tessera um, do have a lot of uh, silicon dioxide, then they probably had to form in the presence of liquid water, uh, which would be sort of a refutation of this assumption. How do you know that that's not true? Um, it, I think there's, there's some hints from the limited IR spectroscopy that you're able to do. And people have, compl uh, have uh, claimed some geomorphic similarities to continental features on Earth. But it's very, I mean, the correct answer is we don't really know the composition of Venus surface, period. But if we did discover that it was felsic, then that would mean there was probably oceans. Cool. OK, and then the mantle model, I'm using Paul Tackley's stag YY code, uh, running it in spherical annulus geometry um, at this resolution with uh, a million traces to track composition and melting. And so the composition ranges from zero, which is pure basalt, uh, which is the Pearson Garnet system, uh, to one, which is Harzbergite, a mixture of olivine and Pearson Garnet. And then we include all the phase changes in this system um, from the surface down to the mantle uh, as tuned to reproduce seismological observations of Earth. And we're tracking uh, partial melting throughout these simulations. And we're assuming spatially uniform radiogenic heating. And we're making an n number assumption that um, most melt Melt, that melt transfer is very efficient and that all volcanism is extrusive. And we use a viscoplastic rheology, which is likely just an approximation of a more realistic rheology, like damage rheology. And, but in this case, uh, you get interesting behavior, uh, which is that the mantle can go from a mobile lid regime, like plate tectonics, to a stagnant lid regime, and then to an episodic lid regime uh, as the surface temperature changes. OK, and then uh, my big part of the code is uh, looking at the energetics of the core. Um, so here's the equation used to calculate the dissipation in the core. And it's a uh, sum of uh, various source and sink terms multiplied by certain efficiency factors. So this first term is for heat sources that are penalized by a Carnot-like efficiency. So this is like radiogenic heating, uh, secular cooling, and any latent heat associated with uh, crystallization uh, at the core mantle boundary or the formation of the inner core. And um, you calculate these T sub i terms individually for each heat source. Uh, for instance, radiogenic heating is a slightly less efficient source of dissipation than secular cooling. Um, and then you have this term, which is for heat sources associated with compositional buoyancy. So this is uh, like silicon and oxygen being kicked out of the inner core as it freezes, and also the precipitation of magnesium oxide and silicon dioxide, if you believe that such a thing is relevant. Um, and these terms aren't penalized by this Carnot-like efficiency term. So for a given amount of heating in terms of terawatts, you get much more dissipation uh, from compositional buoyancy. And then the sink term is related to the conductive heat flux up the adiabat. So if you have a higher thermal conductivity, 
you have a higher conductive heat flux and um, less dissipation overall. And uh, I say conductive heat flux, but that's actually not a term that appears in the energy budget of the core, which is nice because I can run one simulation um, for values like this term and then just analyze the simulation results after the fact to calculate the dissipation for all the different plausible values of the thermal conductivity. Um, and then once you have this dissipation, which is a quantity with units like watts, uh, you can calculate the uh, true dipole moment that you would predict at the surface. And it's roughly uh, this dissipation to the one-third power. Um, we're actually using a scaling that takes into account that if you have more uh, heat production at the bottom of the core, the dynamo becomes a little bit deeper seated. And so um, like uh, source dissipation at the inner core boundary is slightly less effective at producing a strong surface field than uh, dissipation at the core mantle boundary. But it's basically just that to the one-third power. OK, so here's a representative simulation. Uh, I have heat flow from the, uh, from the core and then to the surface are black and red here. And then the volume average temperature of the mantle is here. And then the surface temperature from the atmospheric model is here. And there's four stages of the evolution of Venus in these simulations. Uh, the first is that Venus is in a stagnant lid regime where the mantle is heating up, um, although the core is cooling pretty rapidly because I'm starting it uh, with a, uh, a so-called hot start where it has like a 1,000 Kelvin of excess temperature. Um, but even though the mantle is melting a lot and putting a lot of water into the atmosphere, there's strong hydrodynamic escape. So water is being removed from the atmosphere, hydrogen and oxygen, faster than it's replenished, so the surface temperatures drop. Eventually, surface temperatures drop enough that um, Venus, the mantle, enters a mobile lid regime, like plate tectonics. And that lasts for about a billion years. Um, and there, there are these punctuated resurfacing events that briefly add water into the atmosphere, raising the surface temperature. Um, but again, hydrodynamic escape is removing this water very quickly. Uh, then eventually, the hydrodynamic escape tapers off as the EUV flux from the sun drops. And water that's put into the atmosphere uh, via mantle melting can build up and raise the surface temperatures. And that pushes Venus into a stagnant lid regime, ag regime again briefly. And then for the last two and a half billion years or so, it's in an episodic lid regime, where you have um, moderate amounts of volcanism occurring regularly, but then you have these spikes in surface heat flow, which correspond to regional scale overturning events. So even though you have these spikes in heat flow, uh, these aren't actually catastrophic overturns. These are sort of like uh, continent-sized overturning events. And so this is consistent with like a non-catastrophic view of the cratering method. And the important thing is that the surface temperature is predicted to have increased monotonically for like the last two and a half billion years. So the fact that it's below the Curie temperature of magnetite or hematite now uh, means in these models that it's been below that for definitely the age of the surface and multiples of that. Yeah, um, so I think, I, I mean, these, these end up with the right amount of water in the atmosphere. Yeah, it's like, it's like a few ppm. OK, and then this is the results for the core. Um, this shows the dissipation over time. And uh, this purple star is where I have imposed uh, precipitation of light elements starting. You can see the, uh, the dissipation jumps, and the true dipole moment jumps as well at that time. And then this gold star is where uh, the inner core forms. And you can see that the inner core forms and the dissipation jumps rapidly because you have this extra source of compositional buoyancy. But the um, true dipole moment actually doesn't change much. And that's because the dynamo becomes deeper seated according to the scaling that we're using. Um, and so this is the dissipation with a sort of intermediate value of the thermal conductivity. And then I've rescaled uh, the dissipation to calculate the true dipole moment for different values of the conductivity. So this red curve is if the lowest values for the conductivity are correct. And this would predict that Venus had an Earth-like magnetic field for billions of years and then still has one today. Oops. Um, whereas this blue line has uh, the sort of highest values that have been considered for the thermal conductivity. And that predicts that Venus had an Earth-like magnetic field for billions of years. But then, oh, it died about half a billion years ago, very conveniently. Uh, and this green, uh, this green curve shows the true dipole moment for Earth that's been estimated just over the last five million years. So from this, you can see that um, Earth intrinsically has a lot of variation in its magnetic field. And this is both uh, the uncertainties, which are considerable involved in actually deriving a surface strength from paleomagnetic measurements of rocks, but also just the fact that like, the actual strength does vary a lot. So it's hard um, 
So like the sort of wiggles that I predict in my code would actually be magnified somehow if you wanted like a realistic shrink history. Okay, but this is just one simulation with one set of parameters, but it exhibits the general behavior um, that I found, which is that for most of these uh, simulations, regardless of the parameters that I'm testing, and I've tested quite a few, if you have the lowest conductivities, um, they pretty much all predict that Venus would have a magnetic field today. Um, whereas the high conductivities, an Earth-like core is actually consistent with this constraint. So I quantified this here in this plot. Um, this is the core mantle heat flow at present day. And then this is the minimum conductivity that, could, that the core can have um, that will suppress any dynamo activity in the last 100 million years. So if the, if the actual conductivity is like this value or higher, then uh, each simulation is consistent with the lack of a dynamo today. And um, the different colors of these symbols are different concentrations of potassium in the core. And the different shapes and the different like borders and weird dots I put in the symbols, uh, those are things like the thickness of a primordial layer of very dense material uh, that could result from the crystallization of the magma ocean at the, at the bottom of the mantle. And also um, the density difference between the basalt and the Harzbergite systems in the lower mantle. And I also test different initial temperatures for the core, and I turn the magnesium precipitation uh, on or off. And what I found is that um, the, th the only thing that really matters in terms of this plot is the amount of potassium in the core. Uh, that's the thing that by far dominates um, my calculations. So even though I spent uh, a lot of time making a bunch of contentious statements and fraught arguments about uh, whether or not this precipitation thing is happening, it's very relevant for Earth, but for this specific Venus question, um, not super relevant, and the reason is that uh, it's very hard in these simulations to uh, prevent an inner core from recreating. And once you have an inner core, it doesn't really matter if precipitation is happening or not from an energized point of view. Okay, so um, back to my central point, which is that if you have uh, potassium concentrations close to zero, then an Earth-like core is consistent with the lack of a dynamo on Venus today, if and only if um, the thermal conductivity is actually in this higher range uh, that's been promoted by some recent studies. Um, if the conventional values for the thermal conductivity are correct, then you uh, can't have an Earth-like core for Venus. And if you stuff 400 parts per million or 600 parts per million of potassium into the core, um, then you basically can't do that <laughs> and still have an Earth-like core um, because these simulations inevitably predict that um, Venus uh, would have a dynamo today. And I should say that uh, geophysicists are fond of like stuffing a lot of potassium into the core. Um, but uh, geochemically, it's sort of it's un un uncertain whether or not such high concentrations are actually realistic, because if you put potassium next to metal, uh, you find that lots and lots of potassium goes into the metal. So potassium is very soluble in metal. But if you put uh, potassium-rich silicates next to metal, you find that potassium likes to stay with the silicates. So that given the choice, potassium might stay in the mantle versus actually go into the core. But again, hard experiments, still debated. Okay. So say that people in the mineral physics community come to me, a mere theorist, and say, no, you know, these old conductivity values are actually correct. Um, then we have to invoke some sort of alternative to an Earth-like core of Venus. Um, and the first alternative is something that was recently proposed by Seth Jacobson, Mickey, and colleagues, is that, that the core of Venus preserves a uh, compositional stratification that would suppress convection for all of geologic time. So the idea here is that as you're uh, adding material to the core, if you're just stacking iron alloy um, up and up to make a core, the stuff that you add last is going to have equilibrated with mantle silicates at high temperatures because uh, the temperatures increase as proto-Earth or proto-Venus get bigger. And um, at those high temperatures, you get more silicon and oxygen in the metal. Um, and that will create a compositional gradient where the top will have like 20 or 30 weight percent more silicon and oxygen than the stuff in the bottom of the core. And that's equivalent to thousands and thousands and thousands of degrees of cooling. Um, so if you have this stratification, you can't drive a dynamo by secular cooling or even some sorts of compositional buoyancy. Uh, in this case, you might need uh, energetic impact, like the moon forming impact, to actually mechanically mix the core and homogenize it. So the idea here is that um, if you don't have an Earth-like core, then that means that Venus and Earth ha actually had very different impact histories during accretion which would be a big constraint on the formation of those two planets and on, on the solar system as well. Okay, uh, there's one other alternative, which is that Venus has a completely solid core. Uh, this has been rejected up until sort of recently, 
on the basis of the tidal love number of Venus that was measured by the Magellan mission, which was here. Um, and uh, canonical models for the deformation of Venus that assume a purely elastic um, mantle find that the tidal love number has to be way lower than the observational constraint for Venus to have a solid core. However, just this year, a new study was published that used a viscoelastic model for the deformation of the mantle. And they found that a solid core is actually within the uncertainty of the present measurement of the tidal love number. And so I ran some simulations that, uh, to try to get the core of Venus to solidify. So I had to start, I had to take out every heat source, take out magnesium precipitation, take out all potassium, remove a dense layer that could insulate the core. And I found that even with that, I had to start Venus at super low, low temperatures, low enough, like close to Earth's present day temperatures um, at the beginning in order for the core to completely solidify. And that implies that I don't think you can actually have an Earth-like core that solidifies today um, because there isn't um, enough, you, you, uh, the core, there's not enough total cooling of the core to completely solidify it. So I think that if we discover by having a further refined uh, measurement of the tidal love number or actually figuring out the moment of inertia of Venus, which is currently unconstrained, um, and we find that the core is solid, uh, I think that would be evidence for the first hypothesis that Venus had uh, a different accretion than Earth. Okay, so some uh, conditional conclusions here. Um, so I haven't, using these simulations, I haven't like told you whether or not Venus had an Earth-like core, um, but I think they're still useful because they really clarify uh, the different trees that we could go down as uh, different constraints are obtained. So if the, conduct, if the core is liquid um, and the conductivity is low, uh, or we decide that there is indeed lots and lots of potassium in the core, then the core uh, must be stratified. Uh, it can't have an Earth-like structure and composition. And this would be a huge constraint on the formation of Venus, and it would predict that we wouldn't find any crustal remnant magnetism on the surface, because uh, the processes that homogenize the core um, sort of only, only improve with time, uh, only work better and better with time. Although I haven't really looked into that in detail, so maybe, maybe this bullet point is a little tentative. Um, but the if the core is liquid and the thermal conductivity we decide of iron alloys is uh, high, um, then an Earth-like core is marginally acceptable if uh, the thermal conductivity is what I, uh, what I call the zone of annoyance between 50 and 130. Um, but if the thermal, thermal conductivity is like very high, then an Earth-like core is definitely consistent with the observations. And in this case, um, sort of regardless of the conductivity, you predict that Venus had an Earth-like magnetic field for billions of years, uh, which could strongly affect its atmospheric evolution and the prospects for habitability. And you might expect crustal remnant magnetism, because if the surface is about a billion years old, and the magnetic field tends to die half a billion years ago, um, then it's quite possible that various rocks cooled in the presence of an Earth-like magnetic field. So we might find some. Um, and, but if you find from tidal love number or uh, the precession rate of the spin axis of Venus or something that the core is solid, then you have to invoke very low initial temperatures, and that also would be a dramatic constraint on the accretion of Venus. Okay, so uh, just before I like finish finish, uh, just a brief word about how to detect crustal remnant magnetism. Um, so a few orbital missions have had magnetometers, Pioneer, Venus Orbiter, and Venus Express. And orbital missions in general are vital to do the high priority science uh, for Venus. Um, in particular, we need better maps of the surface and radar. Uh, you can map the mineralogy through, through the, like, the six or seven infrared windows in the atmosphere. And uh, with radar, you can even study uh, active deformation of different tectonic features on Venus. Um, but they're not super useful for uh, trying to search for crustal remnant magnetism because you have to model out um, the effect of the solar wind interacting with the atmosphere. And that's really hard to do because you're trying to extract a signal using a model that you make from the signal. So very complicated. Uh, so probably the better way to do it is an atmospheric platform, which has been proposed and actually done by the Soviets uh, for Venus. And uh, I think balloons obviously are just awesome. Um, and they enable a lot of other good science goals like measuring the composition of the deep Venus atmosphere. Um, and you can actually do seismology uh, because seismic waves on Venus couple to the atmosphere uh, through infrasonic waves. Um, and this is probably the best pathway to search for crustal remnants um, if you had a magnetometer on a balloon because you can actually get close to the surface, get below a lot of this atmospheric uh, magnetic signal. Okay, so overall c uh, conclusions. Um, I think that understanding the Venus-Earth dichotomy is one of the most important outstanding questions uh, in the solar system and really, really vital as we're focusing ever more on terrestrial exoplanets. And Venus is unique in many ways, but a really dramatic fact is that it's the only planet where we don't know if it had magnetism at some point in its history. Um, 
And there's two possibilities, which right now are both plausible. One is that Venus and Earth started off on the same path, formed in exactly the same way, um, but then the fact that Venus was closer to the sun caused their uh, uh, destinies to diverge. Um, but magnetism potentially offers a window into determining uh, whether or not Earth and Venus formed in some different way from the start. And the essential things are mineral physics studies on the thermal conductivity of iron, coming to consensus on that, and also dynamical observations of Venus to constrain the, uh, the state of the core. Um, and just in general, magnetism is one of the only ways that we can probe uh, the past history of the interiors of planets and the mechanisms of their formation. Uh, because otherwise, we're li limited to studying the surface, which has a sort of young age, and there's no such thing as paleogravity or anything. Um, so I hope I convinced you that Venus is a very interesting problem, and I'm happy to talk about all the different things that I uh, said or claimed or implied. So thank you all so much for your attention. Yeah, so that's why I like this atmospheric model is because that point is only in the first half a billion years. Yeah. So once whenever you did uh, observations and let's say you called it the time cloud or the observation time cloud, what you studied was the probable Yeah, so even in my um, like very simple initial models for magnesium, it's super sensitive to the oxygen content. Um, so yes, if you don't have oxygen, then you might not have precipitation. However, in these simulations, I find that Venus pretty much always nucleates in the inner core. It's really hard to keep Venus uh, hot enough unless you have huge amounts of potassium um, that no inner core forms. So um, even though I made a big deal of the precipitation for Earth, for this particular Venus story, you can turn precipitation off, and it doesn't strongly affect uh, this conclusion. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know about the solid core that much, but yeah, adding silicon, I think, will decrease the thermal conductivity. So that could matter also. Yeah. Um, so sort of by definition, you wouldn't, because we're starting... I don't know if the atmospheric model is actually that adaptable, because remember, we're assuming that it has like Venus-like clouds throughout all of its history, and we start it with a huge amount of um, carbon dioxide. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, um, and then once you have an ocean, then you have to worry about like the ocean dynamics, right, and that adds, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, I mean, the dream, the modeling dream is to have like a set of tools where you can just like change some knobs for different planets and simulate a different planet, not quite there yet. 